Um, see, this is why I'm not even going to try to talk to you about this. Uh, um, this, if you want to say this, you have a relationship uh, through your activist work uh, with South Africa. There was a whole bunch of stuff that happened. You're supposed to go, not go, uh, uh, threaten, not threaten. Do you want to talk about that at all? Do you want to uh, say? Well, j- 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 just simply, um, uh, I was I was before I uh, uh, went back to graduate school and uh, was was teaching. Um, I was uh, very heavily. I was medical writing in the '80s, but before that, I was uh, a founder of, founding member of the uh, National Anti Imperialist Movement of Solidarity with African Liberation. What year and was this? This was '73. Sounds '73 or '74 sounds right. You know, and what it is is we picked up, um, you know, you know, support for the ANC in South Africa, support for. Um, uh, Swapo in uh, Namibia. Uh, we supported Joshua Nkomo, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe and uh, Neto in uh, Angola and such. And um, I got involved in the uh, divestment movement. Uh, met a lot of South African expatriates. Uh, and met Oliver Tambo. Uh, met uh, John Makatini. Um, any number of other, uh, you know, uh, men and women. Uh, I started medical writing in 1980, and um, in 1981, an opportunity came up for a, a trip to uh, Johannes, uh, Cape Town, uh, because there was an international meeting of orthopedic surgeons in Cape Town, and um, I uh, you know, wanted to go. Um, the uh, because I was politically active, because there was a sports and entertainment boycott against the apartheid government, folks told me, I had a lot of political folks telling me that um, I um, can't go. And I actually had a basically a, someone I've known since I was a teenager, you know, who I'd come to th- think of as a political mentor and as a second mother, actually disinvite me. I used to go over to her house every uh you know, uh, Thanksgiving Day, because she had a, you know, sort of an activist kind of Thanksgiving, you know, a uh, feast to her home for years. And throughout the late 70s, I went, she and her new husband actually disinvited me, you know, in 81, because I had uh, <coughs> talked about going to the Republic. Meanwhile, the South Africans who were here uh, in New York were telling me that because I was a journalist, that that didn't apply. And then what I should do is I should go. If the opportunity came up, I should go. But then uh, the, and the same brother and sister that were telling me to that I should go uh, because it wasn't I wasn't going there to entertain. I was going there and it would have the opportunity to, uh, you know, to report firsthand on apartheid. You know, and people actually told me how to go about uh, you know, hooking up with people in Soweto and all of that good stuff. Um, uh a couple of brothers pulled me to the side and said, look, uh, given your background, given your uh, movement history, be very afraid and very wary if you happen to get a visa. And you're probably not going to get a visa. But if you get a visa, consider the fact that the U.S. State Department would have okayed or would have, you know, would have okayed. They would have been a collaboration between the RSA, you know, of, of government and uh, the U.S. State Department. And that if you got a visa to go to the Republic, you might never come back. Mm. You know, because, and it would be like a real convenient way to, um, you know, not only to uh, uh, you know, get rid of me as if I was that important, but the other thing was it would be it would serve the propaganda purposes of both governments because it would uh, be somebody black, you know, it would be a street crime, you know, it would look like a street crime, and that it would uh, play into the whole thing about the need for you know a white minority rule, you know, and for all of the you know uh, restrict restrictions and strictures of apartheid because. It would be the same narrative as the United States narrative about crime in the ghetto and the need for police, you know, and the need for uh, the, the police state and everything. Mm-hmm. That's it in a nutshell. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Nutshell. Well, let me then then then, then let me uh, just expand this a little bit. Uh, it seems like the powers that be, if you want to put it that way, they're always coming up with the same plays from the same playbook. So I'm just asking you very simply, because remember, we can go back to, to the 1800s and we can keep on going at each era, you know, blah, 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 blah. What's the, what's the play today? What, what, what would happen today? Because there's so many people out there, there's more activists out there. What, what, what would, what, how, would, how would they handle this today? Not just, not, not, not to my South Africa, I just mean activists in general and say in, in the sphere, in, in, you know, 
what, what have you seen? Do, do you, have you seen any patterns that, that, that that's like that? And also sort of a thinking kind, kind of thing. Well, I'm, I'll take, well, see, the, the thing that, you know, the thing that a lot of um, my peers and I are kicking back and forth is um, the, the public intellectual in the social media and global communication era and everything, you know, and what it means to uh, be, uh, to write a book or to make a speech or to do something that gets you to be the darling of, 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 not of um, you know, electronic media, you know, in the, uh, in the global age and what that means in terms of how you not only package yourself, but who does the packaging? Mm. Um, you know, I... I'm not going to make any dispersions, you know, or any cast anything about Cornell West, except to say that is only on Fox could Cornell West have gone in the Obama era and said the things about Obama that he said. Uh, and that doesn't mean that a large part of this of the critique he had of Obama isn't something that I agree with. Mm-hmm. But I child, I question the choice of venue. It was the message that he had to get out one that was so important to get out that what it is is he would go on Fox and do it because he would run into some static at CNN or run into some static at MSNBC or may not even have been allowed to voice those ideas on CNN or MSNBC. That if he can sit across the table from Sean Hannity and they can have common cause, you know, what purpose are you serving as a you know as a public intellectual um you know and so many of the activists but but this is it, 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 the more change the more it stays stays the same but the question was, he, was activists, he right was was he correct that's the question you can be see you can be correct in the wrong venue Really? You know, yeah. Oh no! I'm saying I'm strongly you, you tell, that you, me the, you can the, be the correct truth, in the, the truth, wrong the venue. Truth, the truth cannot exist, and 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 the truth can only exist in a correct venue. What are you saying to no, me? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this: is that I go, I go on Fox, okay, and I blast Obama. Uh, the, Wait, let's make it correct. I go on Fox and I express whatever problems, ideological, historical, you know, hysterical problems that I may have with ADOS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, That is only going to serve the purposes of the right wing, only going to serve the purposes of, of, of Fox. It doesn't serve any purposes of educating the folks who really need the education and really need to do the deeper thinking. So you say okay, the people that really need the education don't don't, uh, 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 don't listen to Fox. I'm, I'm sure. saying I'm saying that the, I'm, I'm you know I'm saying, criticizing Obama on Fox is like a you know it's like a fox saying that he likes chicken. You know who it is. You know, this, you, this, you're, no, no, you're, I, you're you're not gonna you're, I you're, get you're, you're not word, but. you're not convincing anybody of anything. Okay, you're confirming what they believe. And what happens is you serve their purpose because then what they can do is they can say that the that the that the um opposition to Obama is not racist because here you got this prime okay. this principal okay. no black worries. intellectual who basically is saying okay. the same thing, you know, or you know, or offering criticism of Obama but just in a different vein. Okay. Let, let, different let's language. keep that. The same era. Uh, uh, uh whoever going on MSNBC with uh, with the with with, with, the guy, with Al Sharpton mm-hmm. uh, praising Obama, how is that any different? Tell me how that's different. There's not a lot that oh, that uh, Al Sharpton could say that I would listen to. But no, that's no, no, that's what I'm saying. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I'll compare I, Al Sharpton to Hannity. It's the two um, opposites, and I'm saying that what if, if uh, we'll see that we we'll see, we'll see that, that speaks to the problem of the public intellectual. See, that speaks to that exact problem. See, and it's the it's the other thing. The, the other thing that goes on is this: is that what we do is we put we put value and a lot of energy into what people say because we, it's almost as if MSNBC for liberals and people you know who consider themselves on the left or BAI in terms of radio and everything you know um, people like uh, Rachel Maddow okay what happens is a certain 
you know, political persuasion, you know, that crosses racial lines, puts a validity and you know, puts a lot of energy into who appears on those programs and what they say, just like the, the right, you know, and conservatives put energy into who appears on Fox, whether it's Hannity or Greta Van Susteren or whoever. You see, and what happens is we don't take a critical approach to what the folks say. So someone, so what happens is someone writes a book, I'm not going to call it names, someone writes a book, and the neoliberals, you know, folks who don't necessarily have the best interests of black folks at heart, when at the end of the day, okay, because it's MSNBC, um, that the person, you know, they interview the person on, the, on uh, MSNBC, they kick their idea, they kick the fallacious and crazy stuff that they're saying in their book or in their, in their, their published uh, op-eds or something. And what happens is it gets evident, you know, it, it gets energy. You know, let me be specific. One of the most dangerous and damaging things that's come down the pike in a long time is this idea that there's a loophole in the 13th Amendment. That stuff is dangerous. And I'm gonna tell you why. What's there the, is what's, wait, before you. What's the loophole? I, I oh, know. okay. Now let me explain. Okay, um, when the Thirteenth Amendment was uh, was 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 written and ratified by both houses, and then uh, it passed the two thirds of the states in December of um, 1865. Um, what is said? There's it has a phrase in it. Um, Except by due process of law. The idea being that an individual could not be enslaved right, let's except law. by due process of law. Right. Okay, now the, the, the 13th argument, the loophole argument, is that that loophole was placed in the 13th Amendment to create a new kind of slavery. Mm -hmm. And the consequently, you know, everything from, you know, from convict lease mm -hmm. to the chain gangs to mm -hmm. the, you know, accelerated mass mm -hmm. incarceration of people of African descent and everything, you know, um, was enabled by this loophole in the 13th Amendment. Well, and it? so it becomes, well, no, I'm going to talk about that in okay. a second. Okay. But so that the, you know, so that the, the, the uh, mass incarceration that we saw in the 80s and 90s Okay, has a springboard, you know, a launch pad, okay, and an enabler in this in this uh, loophole in the Thirteenth Amendment. Now, here's the deal. Wait, 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 wait. Are you saying that back when the, the, the people weren't being picked up off the street for vagrancy, that people weren't were uh, back? I'm talking about when it was first and right uh -huh. Are you saying that that wasn't? No, happening? that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this is that there's a principle in old English law that goes back to a minimum of the 14th century, so a minimum of the 1300s, mm -hmm. okay, that says that individuals convicted of certain crimes can be put to hard labor for the duration of their life. Okay, now, this idea in old English law makes its way to the colonies before racialized slavery laws the first slavery laws in the United States were passed in Connecticut in the 1630s, and two categories of individuals could be enslaved for their life for, for the duration of their life. P.O. the prisoners of war, which were Native Americans who were, you know, in the in the, in the, in the wars that the colonists in New England were fighting against the indigenous peoples of North America, and criminal convicts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens is. The racialized slavery laws don't come into play until 16, uh, 1660s Virginia, okay, when slavery is racialized and from the period of 16, uh, like 1662 up until maybe 1691 or so, you get the whole series of laws that not only racialize it, but they make it hereditary, you know, so the child follows the condition of the mother and everything. Now, when the 13th Amendment comes along, the 13th Amendment, you know, that provision 13th Amendment is not a loophole. It simply makes it clear that when we eliminate racialized slavery and this hereditary slavery, okay, we still believe that an individual can be a slave, can be put to hard labor for the duration of their natural life through criminal conviction. Just as you so, can't do it to their children. 
Exactly. Oh, you, you're exactly. Oh, and, and, and it's a process of law. In other words, you know, you know, theoretically, the individual, you know, is indicted. They go through a trial. They're found guilty. A judge pronounces sentence or whatever. And that, that, that's the, that, that through due process of law, that individual, you know, can be uh, put to, to labor for the rest of their natural life. Now, the fact that what happened in the South in the period after the Civil, after the Civil War, you know, after Reconstruction, is that... Um, that uh, increased incarceration, you know, as you mentioned, vagrancy, um, you know, picking people up for vagrancy, picking people up for, uh, you know, for just uh, trumping up charges, the differential in sentencing. Now, see, even the differential in sentencing, the differential in sentencing, the public perception, the common perception that for the exact same crime, it is okay to con to punish a black man harsher pre-exists racialized slavery. You know, the case of John Punch, mm -hmm. which is Virginia's case in 1641, you know, John Punch was a uh, was an indentured servant. Uh, and he and two white indentured servants run from their indenture in Virginia and they get, they, they're captured in Maryland and brought back to Virginia. Now the standard punishment for, uh, you know, for running away from your indenture was a whipping, a flogging, and you got the uh, period of your indenture increased. Mm. So the records are clear about certain things. Number one, John Punch was not a slave. Okay, John Punch had an indenture. Okay, it's not clear what the nature of it was. Okay, um, it may have been to pay a debt. OK, so he had promised. So he had to you know, do a term of labor for a fixed period of time in order to satisfy debt. But anyway, what happens is the two white men get the whipping and they have their indenture lengthened. John Punch is whipped and he is indentured for life. Now, it's important that this is Virginia in, the six, in 1641 because racialized slavery doesn't, isn't you know, put into law in Virginia until, like I said, the period between 1662 and maybe 1691. Some people argue, you know, it extended that period of, you know, of putting the slave laws on the books that characterized slavery in Virginia from that point forward until, you know, until basically uh, 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 the Civil War. You know, some people extend that from 1661, 1662 to maybe, you know, 17. 1703, 1704. But the idea that an individual could be enslaved, could be enslaved for life, it's what I mean by slavery is the state owns your body, mm. okay, and puts you to hard labor for your life, for the duration of your natural life, pre exists that racialized slavery. So when you look at, you know, like, you know, the convict lease, you know, uh, they were picking up black men for vagrancy. Uh, you know, uh, picking black, you know, the, the idea that what it is is that the white man, black man commit the same crime, the black man's going to be, you know, receive a harsher punishment, okay? Um, there were other purposes that stuff served, okay? Number one, you know, it's not accidental that those very states that were practicing that also put into place laws that said that conviction takes away the, your franchise. You can't vote, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you see? And so it serves several purposes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not arguing that men weren't, black men weren't arrested and framed and put through the system and put to hard labor is not a function of racism. I'm saying it's not a function of a, a loophole in the 13th Amendment. And certainly mm. the mass incarceration, you know, in the 80s, you know, uh, you know, the 80s that, you know, that accelerated to the point where in 2007, 2008, you know, you had upwards of 800,000, you know, black men of various of all ages, you know, in, in you know, in some sort of um, incarceration. OK, whether it's jail, you know, actual prison uh, in the United States. Um, I don't know how you link that to the 13th Amendment, because. If the incarceration, you know, explodes in the 80s, mm -hmm. you have to look at something that happened in the period from the 70s to the 80s and after, as opposed to looking all the way back to the 19th century. See, it's the same kind of thing that... Okay, well, you know, okay, I got you. So somebody made, somebody in academia made that connection. Yes, <laughs> okay, and a lot so of people are making it. Oh, well, because the again, it came from someplace. Okay, yeah. because other people will say, "Well, it's eighties, whatever." That was the whole. Then that started with with Biden and 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 Bill Clinton and the whole mm -hmm. drug law thing. Some people have that kind of thing. Okay, let's let's end it. No, oh, wait, I have one more thing to, to sure. ask. This is a whole other weird thing. Why are old people down in the South seemed at least a few weeks ago they so just love Joe Biden? What's going on with old people? <laughs> um, people like old pain. I mean, Joe Biden is a, you know, is a, um, is a known quantity. 
I think they associate him with, I mean, I, I got news for you. There is still black folks who think that a white woman married to a black man or a black, white man married to a black woman can't possibly be a racist. Okay, because you're racist, you know, and it plays right past them the fact that maybe the reason that white man is with that black woman, or maybe the reason that white woman is with that black man, is because they bought into all of the racial myths, you know, all the the, the, the ideas about black sexual, you know, uh, superiority or whatever, or whatever. You know, black women do it better. You know, who the hell knows? Black women are less uh, demanding than white women. You know, uh, black men are. Uh, less uh, uh, patriarchal than white men. I mean, whatever, mm -hmm. okay? And so that simple fact that, Ob that Bi Ob Biden had been with, uh, you know, associated himself with Obama and for those eight years, you know, so defended Obama to a certain extent, uh, will endear him in the hearts of a lot of black folks, and particularly a lot of black folks who uh, who went through the period, you know, of um, not believing that in their lifetime they would live to see a black president or something mm -hmm. like that and everything. Um, okay, I got you. And the other thing is that people don't know Biden's record. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. I, I, actually, this didn't go as I planned. You know, what I mean, I wanted to be more focused, but we, we, this is this will be the third part of a, of our three part conversation. They all meandered, but uh, maybe it's valuable. We'll see. We'll see. Thanks so much. Thank you.